you all so much. Thank you. I just, I was just hoping for the opportunity. First and foremost, thank you all very much for your time and, um, and, and coming out here. I just wanted to make myself available, the first of many, many, um, to find out what it is that our department's doing well, what we're not doing so well at, and what your expectations of me and this department are so we can incorporate that into our strategic plan and move forward. Um, with everything that's going on with policing in this country, um, I can't control Minneapolis, Chicago, New York, but I damn well sure, and I par pardon my language, but I feel very passionate about it, is show other agencies um, that it is possible, that the partnership with their communities is possible, and people really do care. And, and that's how I think that we can be that, continue to be a national leader in what we're doing. So um, with that, I just, again, thank you all very much for your time, and I'm here to listen. And any questions you have of me or anything that you want to say, thick skin, let me have it. How so. do you feel about what's going on with the do you, they, you know, kind of, they're trying to take money from police departments, so do you, uh, do you think you need you, you need less people, or you or you you probably don't have enough? No, actually, uh, looking statistically speaking, so I understand what I understand what it is that you know every agency, every private business, as a matter of fact, has been doing more with less, and um, and we've been doing it for so long. We're all at skeleton crews. The uh, according to the FBI, the average, and that's not to say that's the correct number, but the average number, average agencies. Uh, are hovering around 2.2 to 2.4 officers per thousand residents. Now Montpelier is at about 2.2 um, when you look at our current population of about 7,800. But if you if you factor in the weekday sessions and, and then we pop up to 20,000, yeah, we're you know so so there is um yes, so the majority of our budget for the city here we're at about a. 3.8 million dollar budget uh, department of public works is about 10 point something else so uh and, and about 80 percent of our budget goes towards personnel costs it doesn't, doesn't go for equipment or anything else and then we we don't have enough money to do things like training so one of the big discussions about this is the police need more training the police need more training um we don't have the finances to send people to specialized places and so but that's not to say that it's not incumbent upon me to find different ways and creative ways to get that happening. So I figure if we can't send people to training, we'll figure it out ourselves we'll, and train and do it ourselves. And then any money that revenue we're able to generate from that, send our officers and our dispatchers and civilians to other places to get advanced levels of training. So my whole goal is to make sure we're not tapping into taxes, that, that we're good stewards of um, taxpayer money and, uh, and um, and to go after grants like like nobody's business. I'm sorry, did that answer your question or? Okay. Are there any other questions? Brian, I think I want to welcome you to Thank you. And uh, we are a small community. Hopefully getting more diverse. And uh, and we, you know, you know, we have a very small tax base. And that's, uh, you know, 52% of our downtown area is tax exempt. So uh, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible burden that we have in terms of being able to support basically a work center and a government center for a lot of people. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting challenge. You know, get out and rattle doorknobs, you know. We, we definitely will. And, and, and that's when you say get out and rattle doorknobs, one of the consistent things that we're hearing, not, not just from people in the public, but just from the officers, are how are we going to, we want to get out there and we want to meet people. We want to do foot patrols. We want to be highly visible and we want to get to know the people of our community. And um, we just have to figure out, again, the, the, the personnel based issues. If we only have two officers on street, um, for safety's sakes, we're hoping that two officers can respond to one call. But how do we open it up so that our officers can get out there and meet people and do the best that they possibly can? And, it, and it's funny because um, I do want to hit a Tony Fakus has did an outstanding job in this department and he has been a national leader. And I, and I came from the whole circle of looking, studying departments from consent decrees for the Department of Justice. And um, seeing the, the, the department, I'm like, no way, it's, it's, it's too good to be true. 
when I came here and I saw it and I'm sitting and I, and I get the chance to speak to the uh, officers and the civilians of this department, it's almost like a, the train has left the station and you need to run to catch up with us because if you're not part of this culture and this culture is about service, this culture is about treating people with dignity and respect, and I'm like, whoa, and, and it's legitimate and it's serious. Uh, even to I, I laughed at one point, we were, um, I was someplace else doing some type of training and then somebody said, hey, you know what they call the Montpelier Police Department, right? The MPD. I'm like, no, They're like, it's the most polite department. So within our circles, other agencies are saying, hey, MPD is the most polite department. And you know what? I, I, I damn well will take that. And, and I think that that's awesome. So um, we're going to blaze our own trails and continue to go forward. So, but thank you for that input. We will definitely get out there and knocking on doors. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know domestic disputes is a big one for police officers, and kind of a dangerous situation. Is that a big percentage, do you think, uh, in, in your area down here? Um, this is going to be one of those things that I'm still trying to get my hands around. Okay, yeah. But Officer or Corporal Philbrick is here. He could probably give you a good answer on that. Okay. Yeah. Are you here, Pete? What's sir? Um, I know domestic disputes are pretty hard on police, Absolutely. especially in the country surrounding area. I didn't know, is that a big percentage down here, do you think? Or maybe not as bad it's around not the here? Biggest, it's not the biggest percentage of calls that we interact with. Most of those are quality of life calls and other things. Yeah. Um, they're much more minor, but they are some of the most dangerous and like emotional driven. They seem to be, yeah. Or, you know, incidents where somebody will call for your help and then the next minute they're they're angry at you or, or fighting. And they got a weapon you know, come out aggressively. Or, yeah. Because you're now, you know, dealing yeah, with their, you're in their the partner or their family member yeah. that they care about deeply. So they got they got to the point where they were willing to call for help. Yeah. And then we come and then, you know, so there's a lot of tumultuous. Escalates from there. Um, Good. Yeah. You know, tumultuous feelings there. So we go from being, trying to be sort of the, the savior of me coming to help and of being the bad guy. Both parties. To both. So yeah. you're, you're getting hit. You're getting it from both sides. Which is the reason why it's so dangerous. Which is the reason why we have minimum staffing. Which is the reason why we we show up with a reasonable number of officers yeah, to deal with those types of incidents. Yeah. And that's one of the nice things about being in Montpelier is that we have that peace of mind because of our level of staffing, because of the support the city has given us and the community. Um, and that's a big part of the, the officer wellness pillar of 21st century policing. Because officers are feeling safe when they go into an environment, which means they're less likely to use force of any type. Yeah, because um, they have support. And are also, on the back end, less likely to be emotionally strained or, or mentally um, strained. Right. Um, so it all kind of goes hands in hand. But while it isn't the biggest thing we deal with, it is one of the most significant and most sort of regular, you know, significant you know, cases or incidents we go to. I think in Burlington they were talking about maybe going towards trying to have more people on a agency level go out who weren't police, you know, initially. I don't know. But one of the one of the most diff different different uh, statistically speaking um, calls for service regarding domestic violence is one of the most dangerous calls that police officers can respond to um, and then when you look at uh, th there's another part of it too it's not just you know uh, uh, there's a lot of folks rightfully so that want to make sure hey you know a lot of these calls for service let's reevaluate them we want to reevaluate them too is it appropriate for a police officer officer to respond to this type of call or that type yeah, of call part, yeah. and uh, we need to make sure we open that up when we're reviewing the municipal codes of chapter 11 and chapter 10 here yeah. that we put them out to the public and say hey how do you want us to respond to these things um, but uh, yeah it's it's statistically speaking they're they're very dangerous and if, and if you do bring in if you do partner with social service agencies social and you yeah. tell them hey this is going to be a, it's a domestic incident. We, we want to try to solve this at, at, at a level that doesn't involve, you know, uh, police officers. Yeah. One of the first things they're going to say is we're not going to go into that situation until you go in there first you and you in, make yeah. it safe. Yeah. Then we'll go into yeah. it. So either way, and, and those are policies we can't control. Yeah. Um, but either way, it, uh, if I may, a real quick funny story. When I when I first was getting ready to join the Chicago Police Department, both of my parents are retired off the job. And my father was telling me a story about, you watch your back on domestics, you be careful on domestics. And I'm like, okay, so there's a story behind this, what is it? And I pulled it out of him and basically he came into a, into a, um, uh, to a call and uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 a husband and a wife situation and he had severely beaten her. And as he came in and she's, he's there, he's there. So he fought with the officers, fought with my father and everyone else and as they're trying to gain control, 
she picked up a frying pan and went up behind my father and cracked him in the back of the head. And he's like, yeah, so you make sure you're careful because there's a lot of emotions that come into these types of situations. So it's, um, yeah. But, we, we do, but, but understanding, even with that still understanding that we have to make sure that we don't go into these situations we have to be tactfully ready and mindful these things can happen, but we can't come into a situation and say, it's a domestic, who's gonna be the first person to punch me? Because that starts this whole mindset that yeah. when I come in, somebody's getting their butt kicked. Yeah. And it, it, we can't, we, yeah, we have to make sure from the beginning of our culture that we don't train that way, because in a lot of departments around the city, or not the city, but around the country, yeah. we'll train into scenario-based trainings like, you'll come into a building, they'll say it's a domestic, go in there, and you'll clear the house, and then everything's fine, and all of a sudden, somebody in full camo pops up from the, you know, yeah. from the ceiling hole, and they're like, ah, I got you, and from now on, you're like, holy crap, whenever I go into any house, I, I need to be, yeah. you know, and that just puts us at a different level, yeah. and that starts a culture of, of, in my opinion, distrust. Yeah. So we have to be realistic in how we start and how people who come into this job all the way to the end, yeah. that it's, we have to work on relationships and building. What's your position on body cams? We need them. We would love them. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's an accountability tool to make sure that the public understands what we're doing. And, and as well, it's, it's also a de-escalator that uh, in, in some cases, if we came to a scene, if somebody's getting a parking ticket and they're cussing Michelle out, up and down and, and you hit that record button and people kind of officers go on their best behavior and people who are not doing so good things tend to go on their best behaviors as well but it's a very good accountability tool i don't know if you want to add anything to that there was a study done in, in the california city where they had different shifts um, with different equipment uh, they equipped one shift with body cameras and one shift without and they found that the uses of force in that shift with the cameras went down incredibly just as Chief said, both because officers are aware they're being reported on their best behavior and doing everything by the book, and because the public, as we go up, you can say, hey, you're being on a video recorded right now. What's going on? Well, if you do everything by the book, then that would be a bestseller. <laughs> and so um, it just well, it changes everybody's behavior. <laughs> and, and then, it, you know, it, like Chief like said, accountability, we, you know, we can go back to something and review it, whether it be the, the public or the administration or the officers themselves. Um, and then it's an amazing evidentiary tool as well. Um, everything is reported. Now? Sorry? Do you have any now? We don't. We have we have cameras on our cruisers. Yeah. We yeah. have microphones on our body that record audio. Don't worry, nobody's being recorded right now. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the only recording device we have at the moment. So the, the current legislation... Yeah, and, and that's going to be one of those other things. Like, so the current legislation, I think it's Senate Bill 219 that, that's going through. There's, um, last I remember it, they're talking about an implementation phase statewide of body-worn cameras and uh, by October 1st. I think that was the last thing that I saw. But at the same time, I don't know if the state's going to give money. And so it's like, hey, so how do we creatively deal with this throughout our budgets to implement something like this? We're all for it, but we have to figure out a way to creatively do it um, and, and, and put it in. So um, right now our department is, we're working on doing a, um, like a field study, if you will. Uh, probably within the next week, we have uh, one company called Visual Labs that's looking that that's going to let us do a trial period on it. It's not going to be something that we're going to you're going to you know see officers in the street with the camera active. It's something that we're going to be dealing with and using behind uh, the scenes, testing them out um, because we want to make sure we have a policy in place, a good policy, not one that we just rush together and do it just to have a trial or a trial field run. So we're working currently looking at a visual labs, a watch guard, and um, uh, potentially one one other. But we are right now proactively looking at body worn cameras. Awesome. Thank you. I have a question. Um, are most of the officers unionized? Uh, let's see, our sergeants and our regular officers, dispatchers, and our parking personnel. And what's the attitude of the union? body camera issue and other things we want. We want to have those tools because they're, you know, all they've done in 99% of situations is exonerate officers um, and, and show that, or they've caught officers doing bad things too. Um, so it's been really effective for our accountability and for our, you know, the way the public sees us. Um, and then, you know, again, it's our own, we have our own individual, um, you know, our, we're with the Colonel Earth Police of a larger union that provides us with legal protection as well as um, labor relations with the city and you know, negotiating that contract and so on. So it's helpful to have that large
larger support behind us when it's, it doesn't meet the situation, but it's our own individual unit and our individual you know, department of culture that we, that we put to the public. And so um, you know, our unit and our department and our officers are all for why we're in Canada for accountability and for doing everything to the nth degree to you know, basically improve the public trust. Um, one of the sort of most frustrating things about the worst thing, the worst thing we're feeling is that we like doing all these small, small, small things. We may not be considered police matter. We may not need an armed police officer to go to, but it helps us build a great rapport with the community. It helps the community, you know, trust us, understand us, and have interactions with us outside of a, a crisis situation. Because if you pull us all the way back, where we're basically just a, you know, a, a tactical fire department or something in that respect, then is only going to have those really significant, <laughs> most often negative interactions with those people instead of having those low-level, you know, quality, community-based interactions with the public. And you're talking about, like, responding to non-violent calls. Absolutely. Like, like that's the... Whether, yeah, whether it be parking complaints or somebody's garbage cans are on the, the sidewalk and, you know, somebody's trying to get by or, you know, a neighbor dispute we help mediate. I mean, as the chief alluded to, a lot of times there are a lot of things we would be happy to hand over to other other areas like mental health or social services that would maybe be have more of those resources or be more well versed in it but you know we often we really enjoy and appreciate having those interactions and you know, normalizing having normal interactions with the public um, that helps us with our mental health and our emotional support with the public it's not all negative things we always go into a negative situation it's going to take us toll um, so that's for me personally one of those questions things about the call for us to pull back on things we're going to lose those really positive. And if I could add something to the union thing, because there is a national dialogue, especially like, like CNN's running an article right now that unions are standing in the way of, of uh, progressive police reform. Yeah, the New York Times has been releasing a bunch of articles to that effect. And in some cases, yes. Um, but I would say here within Montpelier, um, there is a very strong uh, working relationship between the officers and the unions and, and the police department and management. So when I came over, Tony Fakus was telling me pretty much everything that's been going on um, and, and how previous negotiations have been going and uh, even to the extent that, uh, that it, it, it's, not a, it's not an adversarial process for the most part. We're, the officers, like, like I, I'm, I'm not sure if you were here before, but when I got here, and, and speaking with everyone in the department, it's more or less, Pete, if you come in here, you need to make sure that you treat everybody in our community with respect. You need to make sure you carry yourself a certain way. You need to make sure you do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. That's the culture. Um, so if, and if I'm not on board, they're leaving me. And, uh, and rightfully so, and I'm, I'm really ecstatic about that. But um, our, our, our working relationship with our union, our officers are pushing for um, programs, reforms, and protections that are good, that are designed with our culture, and our culture is service. And uh, so that's where we're at. For other places, I, I can't necessarily speak to them, but I can definitely say that. Thank you. And if I could also mention something else, uh, it kind of brought, it kind of made me think about something. Um, Again, when we talk about the types of calls for service that our police department should be responding to, we also have to look at what type of laws and ordinances we're putting on the books. Because ultimately, for, for, we can expect that somebody's going to call the police department to deal with some type of an ordinance infraction. So if, for example, face mask. So if someone's at Shaw's and they're not wearing a face mask and someone says, hey, I think you need to have a face mask on because it's city ordinance and they say, you know, the heck with you, I'm not gonna do it, then who are they gonna end up defaulting to call? And if we come and if we try to deescalate situations and say, hey, this is what we wanna do, or the store owners say, they're causing a ruckus, I don't want them in my store, and well, you're gonna have to let me go out of the store because there are people that are like that. And then we have to go hands on with somebody over something like a face mask. And, and, and while we understand what it, you know, the public health issue with it, but it's not gonna look good. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's the absolute truth. None of us in uniform wants to be the next person on YouTube doing something that's going to be, that's going to put us into a certain situation. And we definitely don't want to, to ruin or spoil the reputation of our city. So those are the types of things that we're trying to factor in as we're doing these things, which is why we want to make sure that we're responding correctly to these calls. And, and we, we have a level of an idea of enforcement of, of what the public expects from us.
chime in, Chief? Yes. Sorry, let's chime in real quick on that. The way our ordinances are written in the city, like officers have a lot of discretion on certain things. You know, we can use our judgment as to whether to enforce, how to enforce something or how to deal with it. One of the issues we run into is that the way our ordinances are written, you know, for something like urination, defecation in public, or an open container. Those are only arrestable offenses. They're, they, they result in a criminal charge versus there being some sort of civil ticket or fine you can give somebody. So our sort of our, our tools and levels that we can use are limited. You know, saying so if somebody calls and saying somebody's drinking over in the park over here, we go and address it, we give them a warning, we talk to them, talk to them about it, offer them services. We, you know, we come back the next day and they get the same call and the same thing. And eventually we're using them to move to using that tool. But our, that, if our only tool is to arrest somebody, um, which generally it's just a citation, an invitation to court, not a, not a custodial arrest. That still limits our options as to how we can basically you know, address the issue and keep it to a reasonable, to a reasonable level. So that's something else I would like to see is have our ordinance looked at and maybe have some more levels put in there for us to use. And we are currently reviewing uh, those ordinances. Uh, uh, basically, Bill, uh, the city manager, assistant city manager, they're having all departments going through and looking at uh, at our current ordinances and trying to make sure that they're up that they're updated and up kept. Um, if I may, um, so I, this is one of those cases that I'm going to say that I'm, I'm not too read in to how the policy or the, the procedures and things go. Normally, when you have an emergency situation like that, the, the, the home department kind of will, will maintain control in a sense, if you will, but the operation itself um, will probably go to the, whoever the tactical commander is. Um, so in that case, it could be, you know, the, the Vermont State Police. So yes, uh, my, my predecessor, Tony Fakus, was a big advocate about trying to do regionalized teams to respond to certain things. But again, it comes back to another issue of money and resources and making sure that we're not going to be a burden um, by asking for all different things. Uh, so in, in that particular situation, in those particular situations, I'm not, I'm not sure. But I do know the incident for, um, uh, that happened at the high school, that, that entire scenario continued on for roughly an hour and a half before it unfortunately came to that ending. And there's a lot of people that have asked me, why did all the cops shoot? Um, that's a legitimate thing. And there are a lot of, uh, what, what tends to happen in something like that is when you're in a very high stress situation, you're in a very tunnel hole thing. And, uh, and I'm not excusing the, the, what happened. I'm just trying to, you know, but, uh, so when you hear a gunshot, you're, you're not sure if somebody's shooting at you or anything else. The bottom line of that is, it was an extremely unfortunate situation for everyone around, for the families, for the individual who was shot, and then for the officers who were involved in that as well. And and all the kids, yes, who are who are like, what is happening? What is parents who are getting the calls from the kids who are hearing the gunshots. Yeah. Yes, and, and it, it is traumatizing for everyone. So the hope is that we can continue to have our community partnerships so that we don't that we can minimize if if, if there's a one percent chance that we can make sure that something like that doesn't happen again, and that, that includes us loading a whole bunch of things on the front end to hope that no one falls through the cracks and damn it, we're gonna do it. 
because it's just not, it, it's worth human life, it's worth us doing everything in our power to make sure that we, that we, that we continue to value it and we avoid from using it. There, there's another part that I kind of want to mention as well. Um, I understand that there, there, there was a community dialogue on whether the Montpelier Police Department should have tasers. And, and I, there's a lot of stuff out there. You're seeing officers tasing people and, and it's like, you know what, this, this looks like, like crap. And in the beginning, when, when tasers first came out, there weren't really good policies surrounding them. Tasers were, were thought to be like an end-all tool. I come into it, you guys are arguing. If you guys don't stop arguing, well, I'm going to still keep arguing. Zap! Yeah. And that should not be how tasers are used. So in, in a sense, our culture um, kind of blew that opportunity to have that in the, in the eyes of the, of the public, the people who should be holding us accountable. But then there's another issue. If we come into a situation and someone has a knife or someone has a bat, the only tools that the Montpelier Police Department has right now is this hunk of steel right here and that gun and that OC spray. So our, 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 the, the, the resources we have are limited in trying to de-escalate a situation that we don't resort to deadly force. And speaking of deadly force, we don't do chokeholds. <laughs> uh, to, to me, a chokehold situation is, is something that, that warrants um, on the use of force continuum, it's deadly force. Anything that has something to do with the head, neck, or the spine, the airway, it's, it's deadly force. And the only reason or the only time you should even consider doing something like that is if your life or the life of someone else is threatened within the law enforcement circle. It shouldn't be that what I'm gonna to do to try to gain control of a situation. Montpelier Police Department's not taught that. The, uh, from my understanding, uh, the, the Vermont uh, Training Academy does not teach that. There may be some other places that do. We sure as hell don't and we never will. Are you still having bicycle patrols or I, I know a while ago, I don't know if they can afford that or? I, we do have bicycles still downstairs. Yeah, I know it's two or three years yeah. ago. Yeah, well, I, we actually started doing it a little bit at the beginning of the warmer weather, but because of the the you know, coronavirus situation, yeah, because of it, yeah, came a little more difficult. It's pretty I don't know if they're effective. You know, when you had oh, they're they're amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yes, take care. It's a matter of staffing. It's a pleasure yeah. to meet you. We have the equipment, officers who are trained in the um, sort of the you know the tactics and, and techniques of bike patrol oh yeah um because you can see a lot on a bicycle oh absolutely right? yeah. and, and it's quiet right but back in you know to... the biggest thing is just being out and open yeah and available to the community just yeah. as we are now and they're being closed into a you know a in a cage and driving yeah. by yeah it's a lot you know when you're wearing shorts and a polo shirt you're a little more being a little bit more approachable yeah than i am now but also as long as you, you know, know all the gear the radio and everything yeah. with you that's true too then they're going to be complaints about chicken legs too i've seen some of the legs <laughs> <laughs> it's a great tool and something we enjoy doing, especially with the big events. Like if this were yeah, with third, big events, you could, yeah. If we if we'd had a big event yesterday, there would have been at least three of us on bikes. With it, yeah. Because we don't we don't have that many cars anyway. But it's just such a great tool with a huge crowd where there's no vehicle access here. Yeah. We can get around town faster on a bike than by a car. There are also, and I, and I don't want to mean, mean to be the negative Nancy, these are programs that we want to do, but it also, we have to look at, at what our limitations yeah, are. So, funding and, yeah. well, 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 not even that, I mean, because oh. I'm pretty sure we can, we can find uh, donors or different ways to get, the, to get the, the bikes in, but then it becomes an issue of there are only two officers on a shift. Yeah. And one officer is, say, if we're, doing, we're going to do foot patrols or they're biking, yeah. and there's a domestic incident that's going on on the other side of town, how do, now there's a safety issue so we have to make sure that we're we're, we're very deliberate and very careful in how we do this and then the other thing is too we don't want to again it comes back to being stewards of, of taxpayer dollars we we don't want to you know how's that going to look that um is that wise for us to say okay we're going to bring in these two officers here on overtime time and a half yep. to ride up and down the main street doing what we what we want to do and what we're supposed to be doing but at the same time, we're bringing you in on overtime to make sure that we have enough people to cover the streets. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tricky thing, but um, your department is up to the challenge and we want to do it. So we'll find ways to make sure that we do it and we're out there. I don't, I've heard a little bit about the service as part of your culture, which sounds amazing. And I'm wondering about how service shows up with how you take care of each other and like how is self-care and mental health available to your officers and that also just brings up like when an incident happens that's disturbing do you have a really amazing process for debriefing it or is it joked about you know 
What is it like? How do you debrief? Is there a process? What's the culture? Do you care about each other? Oh, yes, we do. I, we Can you have emotions? I would describe it as a family. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah we, Some families are toxic. Oh, no, I have <laughs> Again, we, and, you know, we have our interpersonal issues at times, but I describe it as a, as a productive, loving family. I mean, we all work strange hours with each other. We all deal with in interesting incidents, and that builds strong relationships. Just as you know, any, any type of other difficult situations can, whether that be the military or you know, other hardship positions. But um, we have what's called an employee assistance program set up, which provides free counseling to any officer that requests it. And obviously, having them be available doesn't mean somebody's going to use it, but it's accepted. Um, but we're fortunate to have a culture where you know, we, we, we talk freely about the fact that, oh, I go and see. You know, and my counselor is Joe. I see I see I've counseling for a variety of reasons over the years. Um, and some of that was you know, most recently been provided by the PD for the last several years. You know, and we have several people like myself who are peer counselors who are trained to like recognize signs of of issues but also to kind of be advocates um, for that type of thing. It's kind of like, you know, like, well, you know, not just a, like the phrase, I'm not just a whatever, I'm also a client or whatever. I mean, you know, that phrase from the like TV or long ago. Um, so while most of us will talk openly about the fact that we do see counseling, how it's benefited us, um, I think that's the biggest hurdle is making it normal, making it accepted. And I, I believe we have that here, because I use it as effective me, I use it, I see, you know, how my, my colleagues use it, and, and, you know, bounce back from difficult, difficult things, you know, we have our struggles, whether it's an individual incident, or just, you know, stuff at home, or, grind of the work is going to a lot of negative things. Um, it's very, you know, very effective in that we have had a, a critical incident, a major incident, like when the, um, you know, the shooting at the high school or the one after, uh, on the bridge or other incidents like that where we've had, where there's been a death involved, there's a, de you know, there's a debrief process, there's a crisis team that comes in and you know, after the shooting, I was involved in the Mark Johnson shooting, I was the MPD officer who was there and who fired. Um, so I've had to address that myself personally, but as a group, we sat down after the event, everybody who was involved, you know, the game wardens who came in afterwards and used metal detectors to find, you know, they've been around all the way down to the officers like myself who, who pulled the trigger, as well as the dispatchers who were dispatching, and everybody who was involved came in and sat down and talked through everything, you know, and shared. And, you know, everybody's different. Some people were sharing more than most, but when you sit down there together, you have a, a trained team that is kind of, trained you know, to pull you know pull these things out of it and make it normal um, you, you see everybody kind of open up and think the sharing start happening and the venting and the you know just the, the healing start yeah. you know, it's, whether it's these significant incidents or just the everyday stuff it all takes a toll yeah. And yeah. Like, you're, like you're pointing out we need to take care of ourselves because if we can't take care of ourselves how can we take care of the community yeah. mm -hmm. if i'm depressed or angry or upset and then i go and deal with somebody else's problem whether it be a domestic or, or a parking complaint that's that's going to lead. I think that is what leads to officers overreacting and, and really bad situations happening involving police officers. And you and you, I, the, the spirit of what your your question is is there has long been. I'll throw my wife on the. On, on on the burner for a quick second as well. When I first met her, she said she'll never marry a police officer because we're too arrogant, we're too macho, we're too type A personality. Nothing bothers us, nothing hurts us, and that's just, it's bull crap. And then when you have a culture that continues on with that, almost like, hey, I broke my leg, we'll rub some dirt on it, get back up and go. We don't talk about our feelings here. That, that adds to a whole issue of promoting an us versus them and making it making it so that you try to protect yourself and by, by doing it you demonize the people that you're sworn to protect that's just where it comes from and we need to be we, we need to promote that we need to share our stories and we need to admit that a lot of these things that are going out there that we see and that we're dealing with and that uh, they, they have trauma with us and not only that but they also have trauma with you if you're in a, in a situation th that's going to bring trauma then we need to be incumbent upon, we, we need to do what we can to help you and your families as you're going through these same issues. So it's within this department, it's okay to be a grown person and cry. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Myself, personally, I do have PTSD and I got it pretty bad. And I'll tell that to anyone else in this department so that they realize that it's okay to, to be human, it's okay to hurt, but you just got to climb out of that. Yeah. Are you familiar at all with Resma Monacan's book, My Grandmother's Hands? 
I'm sorry. My grandmother, I was just told to read that yesterday. I have a copy for you. I would love to read and it. And I would love to talk to you after. Would, would love that opportunity. I'm Abby Jaffe. I'm from the Everything Space, and I'm a somatic okay. movement educator. Uh -huh. And I've been working with the police with victim services in Burlington before, and I'd love to make your acquaintance. I would love the opportunity to speak with you. My grandmother's hand by Resma Monakin. It's about racialized trauma and how it shows up in white bodies, black bodies, and police bodies. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have a copy for you, too. <laughs> yes. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad you can join us here in Montpelier and your whole family, too. Um, I'll say that this guy is one of my favorite um, people and really it's been an honor to get to know uh -huh. And uh, that, that it, you know, when we talk, it's, it's, it occurs to me that, you know, you work for us, yes. the general public, and we help define what we want you to do. And uh, I think it's a question of really all of us looking at what are the needs and then what's the most appropriate way to meet those needs. And, and at the same time to look at what it is you're doing and see which of those things you don't want to be doing or shouldn't be doing or we can do better in another way. Uh, I think a lot of it starts with helping us understand what you do and how you do it. Mike and I have talked about that extensively. You are 100% uh, correct. I think it starts with making sure that we have all the information we possibly can give out to the public, yep. we make sure it's out there. And we're in the process of doing all that right now. Traffic data stops, what times of day that we're dealing with, the, the majority of the incidences that we're responding to, uh, what our policies, rules, and regulations are, um, how we're doing our budgeting, um, how we're forecasting. We're going to push that all out as soon as we possibly can within hopefully the next coming two to three months. Well, welcome, look forward to working with you. Thank you, I look forward to working for you. A PA system. I wonder if you could use it. <laughs> I'm having a hard time hearing anyone else. Sorry. Yeah, yeah if you, if you yeah, next it's time. I could, yeah. Well, next weekend, <laughs> Saturday the 11th. Great. Are there any, are there any other questions? Anything else that we can learn? Anything else that you want to see your department doing that we may not be living up to? We're here to listen, we're here to improve, we're here to be better, and we're here to be the best damn department in the state. And we, and we can only do that by knowing what it is that you expect from us. Thank you for being here today. No, thank you. Well, I know you said you're short-handed and all, but I, I, you mentioned this, I believe, and I now have officers walking the beach, not on bikes, per se, but actually physically walking the streets and talking to people. I know you're short-handed. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the old Chief Fox kind of thing I grew up with? Yeah. I only caught some of that, I'm sorry. Are we, are we going to try to go back to, to walking the beat or to, to oh, walking no, in high vis? Wanted. That's what we wanted to do. You know, the most stressful things. The last, the last two years, I've worked 600 hours of overtime each year. And that's to maintain our minimum staffing of having, you know, the overnight hours from midnight to eight is you know, a supervisor and an officer. Um, the rest of the time, other than on weekends or holidays, it's a minimum of two officers and one supervisor. Um, which means, I don't know what, what people think we have. Um, I feel like some people think we have like 50 officers on a shift, but we don't. We have a lot of times it's just two officers responding to calls, a supervisor having to supervise and do their own administrative tasks, as well as respond to the calls themselves. You know, on any given shift, you know, plus some specialties such as uh, you know the detectives and the school resource officer and administrators like the chief and the captain. You know, the deal, the detectives deal with the more significant cases. They would we're pulling an officer off the street for you know an unreasonable period of time. You know, there's a ton of administrative stuff from budgeting to you know, you know, purchasing and scheduling and personnel and all these other things that you know our chief and our captain are supposed to do. And they, you know, they still manage to work shifts and cover us. I mean, right now you know, we're at the highest level of staffing we've had in a while, which has certainly been you know a relief valve for us. But you know, 600 extra hours a year. I mean, it's, it's a great paycheck, but it takes its toll. Yeah. And again, we're looking at officer wellness there. You know, we need to, uh, that's part of, staffing falls under that, that umbrella. Right. But we are- it make more sense to pay more people for like just a full-time job than to pay people like you for 
so much overtime. I'm sure you're thinking about this in a more advanced way than me. No. But it's I'm been, just like, it's wait been, a minute. No, you're right. You're right. You are 100% <laughs> you, correct. You know, you can come right up with that right now. There's our conversation. And, you know, we've, we've been talking about it. So. You are 100% correct. To, to look at the overtime figures that we've had, average them out, yeah. and see if that we can create an additional person to come in. But we want to make sure that when we do that, we let, let the public know why we're doing it to make sure that it's, it's the right thing to do. You know what, like, um, summer police officers that come in just for the summer, like, at beaches and places like that? Mm -hmm. That was um, so. I think it would. I'm, I'm getting the feeling of like a part-time officer. One of uh, Tony and uh, Doug Hoyt, right? Who was before Tony. And so Montpelier has a has a program that they can train officers to be part-time officers. I think it's a level two certification. Um, the only issue with that is that Tony and Doug and actually this department wants to make sure is that. Sometimes with a part-time officer, you may not get someone who is capable or willing to have the same culture of commitment that a full-time officer in this department has. So we want to make sure whoever, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky that, that that person is trained to the same level of expectations that they do on a daily basis because the last thing we want is somebody to come in here and screw it up. Oh, yeah. I think that's where a lot of the problems come from. But, you know, you alluded with officer, with officer wellness where you, officers overreact or react poorly. Imagine how an officer who had two weeks of training, you know, a, a period of, of field training with another officer, and now they're inserted in a situation that the rest of us are all full-time officers have been doing this for, for years, sometimes, you know, multiple decades. You're going to insert somebody, a part-time college student or something like that, who's willing to come in and work for that wage, you know, 15 bucks an hour versus 20-something, you know, you know, basically the minimum requirements, the minimum level of maturity, the minimum experience, you're going to throw them out on the street. And, and expect the same level of service and the same level of, of responsibility and, and, and you know and liability as well. So the trade-off. I, I agree with that. Matt, because I grew up on the seacoast in Hampshire. Absolutely. Oh, so like, like Maine. I mean, the, all those departments do that. Yeah, and they overreact in a lot of cases yeah. because they didn't. Really they've got that they've got that mental you know yeah. respectfully that mall cop mentality yeah yeah that's what we're trying to we're yeah. trying to avoid here we don't yeah, want that saying, I wasn't asking that you would do that uh-huh and that's a national issue too I mean you know we may hold ourselves at a very high standard but if you look at any other state and that's a frustration of ours being lumped in especially now with this you know the, the whole police you know with the police is, is all, all the cops in the country there's thousands of departments, hundreds of thousands of officers, all the different levels of training, culture, education, experience, and we're all getting lumped in together. So all the effort we put in now is very frustrating and, and disheartening to, be, to have to have that sort of, you know, all that effort thrown into our, our face. When a department down south is paying 12, an officer 12 bucks an hour, sending them to a, you know, a three month academy and then putting them out on the street and saying, yeah. you know, just to have a warm body there. Yeah. No, you, you, you make a very good point. Yes, sir. No. So uh, my name is Eric Jacobson. I'm a resident of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things about Montpelier generally that some of us are working on is to have a more diverse population emigrate here. And one of the problems is when we have um, situations, that, unfortunate situations that we had recently in which one, possibly two mentally ill, Possibly unnecessarily. What can you do in the short time to help prevent that kind of situation happening again? We obviously have mentally help the old people in the community. And this is going to be a very tough time going forward. Mm -hmm. There are going to be incidents like the ones we saw. How can you prevent that kind of uh, killing? I, I... I don't know if I can. I'm just being honest. The only thing I can do is try to uh, is try to put every every level layer of protection I possibly can um, within the community to hope that it doesn't happen again. I, I, we could we could find somebody. We we could go on a call to deal with somebody who's going through a mental health crisis, and then try to uh, then move them over to our. Well, we have a team two training, but then move them over to soon. We'll have an embedded social worker that'll be part of Washington County that will be responding with us, and trying to get that person into treatment. 
but we can't get them in a treatment if they don't want to go or if they don't want to take the medication because there's side effects to it. And if something unfortunate happens like that, but that doesn't mean that we don't try. Yeah. So I can't make that promise to you, but I can tell you that none of us wants to ever be in that situation. And we're going to do everything we can to get people the help so we're not seeing repeat calls like that. And, and there was one other thing that you had mentioned about trying to, um, uh, trying to uh, uh, increase diversity within the state. My experiences have been growing up, my parents, uh, well, my grandparents on both sides came out of uh, Alabama and Mississippi. And they migrated up to the larger metropolitan cities because there were jobs. And so, so there's that, there's why there's diversity, in my opinion, in those, in those other places. But even in Vermont, there's challenges here. The socioeconomic challenges here, there's a lack of jobs here. So if, if folks who are already living here in the state are having a difficult time finding jobs that pay living wages um, with lower tax rates and everything else, then it's going to be very difficult to attract someone else to come up as well. Would you be open to having a division within the Montpelier Police Department that had a social work, social intervention? There's been a number of proposals. I know there's a, a Professor Mohammed at Harvard who's making this proposals that I just found quite interesting about having uh, a more complex uh, emergency intervention options. And one of those is to have more dedicated people who are trained as social workers. Maybe Washington White is sufficient, I don't know. Maybe, would you be open to that kind of thing if it seems useful Absolutely. and necessary? Absolutely. The, uh, the state of North Carolina is what's called a mobile crisis team every county has their own team, and I don't know if there's that deploy on call, just like the dispatch with a fire in EMS, to scenes, and I did this for several years, and, and most often we did it without law enforcement, all hours of the day, to, to deal specifically with mental health. So, other states can do it, I don't know, I, I realize it's probably not something you guys would put into play, but it would be something that they look at at a higher level. Yes. No, typically, typically the bigger agencies only have that. But the beauty of it is, is I have the I have the newest updated version that we did in Alamogordo on a USB drive on my desk right now that we will be implementing uh, CIT training for the officers here, um, not only just here but any other agency that comes in and just, hey, we're not going to charge you outlandish fees, just come on over and get trained, because it's not about us, it's about making sure that all officers have the resources to keep and protect lives. We'll, we'll, we'll be doing that as, as soon as possible. Have you heard of the Washington County Mental Health Screeners? No, I have not. So there's a 24 hour mental health screening program. And they're on all hours, they will come, as we call them, respond to a mental health crisis. However, they will not come if the team is not safe. Right. So more often than not, we will go make the team safe, address for a leader, convince them to come with us to the hospital or to our police department. Um, or if the situation is extreme enough, take them in protective custody, take them to the hospital for, for evaluation. Cool. So there is currently a 24-hour program you know, where they have staff available. Obviously, they're not right there with us at all, all hours of the day. And right. I think that would be the greatest advantage that the chief is talking about, having that embedded worker who, when it's appropriate especially, either, either they go in our, in our stead or they ride with us to the incident and maybe take point on it instead of, you know, the armed officer who maybe has dealt with any number of other things and has any other number of skills going and trying to, you know, to, to deal with that situation instead of let's have the, the professional come in and that's possible when it's safe to do so. Um, so that's obviously something we're moving towards. Cool. Yeah, that's the, if, if you want to, you could probably Google uh, the Team 2, then that's what it's called. Here. Team two. Team two. Uh, yes, sir. Just a comment. I did want to say this is one of the best partnerships uh, between Washington County and uh, and also peer uh, networks, so mental health peer networks inside of Central Vermont. Um, so we run a peer bed here as well um, up on Heaton Street. Uh, so we continue to have great partnership. I just want to welcome you aboard. Appreciate it. And, uh, it was a very good department here. I trust you. Thank you. Thank you. And I've heard so much about Washington County Mental Health. That's
is actually like a, a, a national known provincial line of what, what to do right now. Right. So this, there are a lot of good things going on here. There are a lot of challenges still, but a lot of problems that other places don't have. And um, it, I'm, I'm, I consider myself very fortunate to be here. And hopefully we can take it to the strength of the Hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you. I've already seen the results of your work by participating in BLM uh, marches and speaking to your officers and they've uniformly been kind and cooperative, peaceful, so thank you for that. I am giving you my card to volunteer, sir. I have 40 years of experience in operations management and organizational analysis. I'm a professor at Norwich University. I will volunteer to show you and your staff some novel methods for running focus groups, analyzing the results, develop, I teach, I've taught survey design, you know, I teach applied statistics, um, uh, how to design surveys that, that will be helpful to you rather than ambiguous and so on. And uh, I, that's all. I, I just wanted you to know that you. you have support and I'm with you. Thank you. We, we, this is what we appreciate is, is is being able to, to listen to our community and, and take the help when we're offered the help and I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, any other challenges, anything else that we can answer? And, and we'll, one. yes sir. I don't like the colors on the new, the new colors on the cruisers, the black and the thing. I liked it when they were white with blue, it was friendlier seeming. This looks like every other department, you know, prowling around in black. And I, 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 I don't know if it's a, you know, the, the first thing on your list, but the third thing is, is put it before. But let's go back. Let's go back to the kinder, gentler colors on the police cruisers. Thank you. And we'll definitely have that conversation. We could also say the protecting sir. Like protecting sir. Yeah. Well, Actually, we're going to have to pay for that. Mike. It's actually a national movement to go back from, from police officer to peace officer. Peace. So there's an organization that facilitates that type of thing, yeah. both in you know, a, a nomenclature on the cruiser, but also yeah. in the mindset. So. Yeah, like some of us that are older, like myself, um, you know, I grew up with beat uh, Never two cruisers here and there, but most they were both. You know, they're all part of the So anyway. No, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm still of the same, same mindset, though. Very much so. The nice thing about the cruisers is they, they're full of equipment to help oh, us yeah. do our work. You know, so we have, some, you know, all these tools in our belt. But we also have many in the, in the cars as well, from ballistic shields to less lethal shotguns and launchers. Yeah. You know, to other, other, you know, flares and cones and things like that to help make either areas safe or, you know, help help us be more safe and keep the community more safe. So. That is a benefit of having them, but I totally understand why it's such a benefit to be out on the on, the, on foot or on the, yeah. the bike and actually like yeah. in the community. Yeah, support is friendly or oh, yeah. yeah, there's a there's a compromise to be had, absolutely. Protecting yourselves extra with the COVID, like going into certain situations, like do you have N95 masks and face shields and all of that protective equipment to go? Because we, we, we realize that we're going from place to place to place potentially, and we want to make sure that we're not bringing any contamination with us as we interact with the public. Yes. In addition to the equipment, we're also changing. We also change certain procedures, like doing as many calls as possible by phone, having people come out of wherever they are into the you know into the air and the light. There's just small things like that, which can also be, be beneficial generally. Um, have been really helpful. Yes. Exactly. No, thank you, and we really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to meet you. We're going to do as many of these as we possibly can, because um, I want to do my best to hear from everybody, because I want to get to meet my bosses. So thank you all very much. Thank you for your candor, and please hold my feet to the fire when we're doing when we're doing something wrong.